So again, um, welcome. I think that we'll go ahead and get started. It looks like we have a good group with us. Um, everyone, welcome to you. Uh, we're here today for our free CLE webinar on nitrate pollution in Minnesota's drinking water. I'm Kevin Ruther, Chief Legal Officer of the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, MCEA. We're really happy that you were able to join us today. So welcome. If you're new to MCEA, we're the leading legal organization working to protect Minnesota's environment and the health of its people. We work in four different program areas, climate and energy, healthy communities. Uh, we have a program up in Northeast Minnesota in Duluth that works primarily on mining. And then of course, water. Today's CLE, there's something in the water, legal tools to protect drinking water from nitrate pollution, We'll look at the public health threat that nitrate contamination poses to residents in Southeast Minnesota, and specifically at EPA's authority under the federal Safe Drinking Water Act to intervene and help the state get a handle on this problem. We have three panelists today who I want to welcome. Um, first, Carly Griffith. Hi, Carly. Um, Carly is MCA's relatively new uh, water Quality Program Director. She's been with us now for less than a year, but she's really just stepped right up and taken the reins and is doing an amazing job while simultaneously completing her PhD in geography. Um, Carly will be talking today about what kind of threat nitrate poses and how nitrate has become a problem in southeastern Minnesota's Karst region. Next is Lee Curry. Hi, Lee. Uh, Lee is a longtime attorney. She led MCA's climate and energy program for several years. Um, she's been a special assistant Minnesota attorney general working on climate litigation. And this year she returned to MCA as our director of strategic litigation. We're really glad to have her back. Uh, Lee will discuss the legal authority EPA has to step in when drinking water resources face an imminent threat and MCA's petition, MCA's petition to EPA asking them to do that here in Minnesota. And finally, we're really happy to welcome Tyler Lobdell. Hey, Tyler. Uh, Tyler is a staff attorney with Food and Water Watch. He's based in Boise, Idaho. Food and Water Watch, if you're not familiar with them, is a national organization fighting for safe food, clean water, and a livable climate. Tyler joined Food and Water Watch in 2019 and has been engaged in administrative advocacy and litigation on water pollution from industrial farms. He'll give us an overview of how EPA's emergency response authority under the Safe Drinking Water Act has been used throughout the country. So happy that you're here, Tyler. Okay, um, what we have planned today is that each panelist will present for about 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll take your questions. Um, we'll be using the Q&A function. So if you look at your screen down in the middle, uh, at the bottom there, there's a little button that says Q&A, go ahead and press on that and type your questions in that box and we'll be able to see those and hopefully we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentations. And finally, if you're an attorney, we have applied for CLE credit for this presentation. The code is 488230. That'll also be uh, at our website, 488230. And um, approval is still pending, but we're hoping that that will come through soon. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Carly, you're going to kick it off. Thank you very much, Kevin, and welcome, everyone. We're excited to have you here today. So I am going to share my screen, and I will just ask you all to let me know if you can see it. Yes, okay, so let's get started. So we are here today for a webinar titled, There's Something in the Water, Legal Tools to Protect Drinking Water from Nitrate Pollution. So I know that we're here to talk about uh, water, water quality uh, threats, but I wanna start with a story of pristine water in a particular region of the state, and then we'll zoom out and talk about the broader statewide issue. So I want to start with a focus on the Driftless region of Minnesota or the Karst region. This is a geologic region in southeastern Minnesota that was left unscraped 
by the glaciers of the last ice age. And as a result, it has these, uh, it's very famous for its cold water streams, which can sustain healthy trout populations. And it's a destination for people who fly fish to come visit the Karst. And you can see on the map in the upper left-hand corner that the Karst is in southeastern Minnesota. There are some isolated Karst features in other parts of the state, but it's primarily found in that southeast corner. So what I want to show with this diagram is that the very same qualities that make the Karst region a, a beautiful place also make it a vulnerable place. So because glaciers did not deposit sediment on the landscape, there is a very, very thin layer of topsoil, and below is porous limestone bedrock, which has fractured cracks in it that the water can move through. There are also features like sinkholes and groundwater-fed streams, which illustrate the very close relationship between surface water and groundwater in the karst. And what all of this means is that surface level contamination from land use practices can quickly infiltrate the groundwater and pose a public health risk to the water supply. The karst region also has a high concentration of industrial scale agriculture, and this includes both animal feedlots and monoculture row crops, so think corn and soybeans. This map shows that there is a high density of feedlots of different sizes with different levels of state regulation. So the smaller green dots on the map are feedlots that uh, don't require a state permit to operate. And the blue and orange dots are larger feedlots that are permitted by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And the important takeaway from this map is that there are really high nitrogen inputs in this part of the state, both from manure and fertilizer on row crops. So what is the state of the water in this vulnerable region of the state? Well, to give you a sense, about a year ago in July, 2022, 2,500 trout were killed in what is called a fish kill event which is basically the localized die-off of a fish population in a short period of time. This was in Rush Creek, which is in the heart of the Karst region in Winona County. Um, and in the Karst, fish kills have increased in both intensity and frequency over the past eight years. In fact, since 2015, there have been six fish kills documented in the Karst. And in three of those, thousands of fish were killed. So while fish kill events can occur from natural causes, this is highly unlikely in the pristine cold water streams of this region. Instead, recent agency reports have loosely started to point to agricultural practices like manure and pesticide runoff, but with little to no enforcement actions taken. Now, because of the close surface and groundwater connection that I discussed earlier, on this slide with the diagram of the Karst. There is also extensive contamination of the groundwater, which provides both public and private water supplies. Um, and that contamination is from nitrate. So in the eight county region that encompasses most of the Karst, nitrate levels in both private wells and public water supplies routinely exceed the federal drinking standard of 10 milligrams per liter, which was set in 1962 to protect against blue babies syndrome. However, more recent research has increasingly shown the risk of human health impacts at much lower levels, as low as three milligrams per liter. And those impacts include an increased risk for adverse birth outcomes and an increased risk of various types of cancer. Now I wanna add a little nuance to the data on this screen. So the map on the left-hand side shows private well testing data. And the map on the right-hand side shows public water supply data. So I'm going to use my cursor here to circle Winona County on the map on the left-hand side. So in Winona County in 2017, 19% uh, of the wells tested were above that federal standard of 10 milligrams per liter. And if you zoom in even further to the township scale, over the 10-year period that these tests were conducted from 2009 to 2018, that are shown in this map, over 50% of private wells tested were above that federal standard in two townships within Winona County. And then uh, data from these testing programs 
also shows that water supplies that test at or above three milligrams per liter have a 96% likelihood to also have pesticides. This is a really clear indication that the source of the nitrate contamination is agricultural land use practices like excessive fertilizer and manure application. Now, this problem does go beyond the cursed region that we opened with to be, be a much broader statewide issue. Um, and as this map shows, there are two particular areas of vulnerability, the central sands in the center of the state and the karst region that we've discussed in the southeast corner. So now let's zoom out from the karst region and look at the broader scope of the problem. Let's talk about feedlots. So Minnesota is home to nearly 24,000 feedlots across the state, and 18,000 of those are regulated under the state feedlot rules. Uh, CAFOs, or Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations, are large industrial-scale feedlots. Since 1991, as this graph shows, the number of CAFOs have tripled in Minnesota, along with an increase in monoculture row crop production and the general industrialization of agriculture across the Midwest and the United States. So as you can see from this graph, the area of largest growth in the number of CAFOs is swine facilities by far. But even for these other categories where the numbers remain more steady, the size of the individual CAFOs themselves have also grown significantly. So where are these feedlots located? As you can see, beef and dairy operations are concentrated in those two regions of high vulnerability that we discussed, the central sands in the center of the state and the karst region in the southeastern corner of the state. And the large growth of swine facilities really has crept up from Iowa to the south. So what I want to talk about now is nutrient overload from both nitrogen and phosphorus that results from the agricultural land use practices. So in the same 30-year period that CAFOs have tripled, monoculture row crop production has also soared. We now have an additional 1.5 million acres devoted to corn in the state. And a lot of that is for animal feed for feedlots. So the two industries bolster each other. So in addition to the 50 million tons of manure produced by feedlots every year, fertilizer sales have also jumped by more than a third. Now, both manure and chemical fertilizer are rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. These are crop nutrients that crops need, but when they are applied in excess, they can pollute both surface and groundwater. And this is especially true in vulnerable areas with sandy soils or karst bedrock where pollutants can easily reach the groundwater. So in these two maps, the outlined counties are areas of the state where nutrient overload beyond what the crop needs is the most severe. And what, this map, what these maps show the most clearly is that the overlay of vulnerable areas with either those sandy soils or karst bedrock together with intensive agricultural land use leads to nutrient overload that impacts our water supply. So if you remember those statewide nitrate contamination maps from a few slides back, these highlighted areas are the same parts of the state where polluted drinking water um, is the most prevalent. So analysis by the Environmental Working Group in 2020 found that between chemical fertilizer and manure application, some counties are at nearly double the recommended nutrient application rates. These recommendations come from the University of Minnesota. And it's important to remember that these rates themselves are calculated to optimize crop yield rather than protect water quality. But even with these rates that we have, in Winona County, the amount of nitrogen that is land applied across the county from both fertilizer and animal manure is 194% of the recommend of the amount that's recommended to meet crop needs. So this is the equivalent of nearly 5,000 tons of nitrogen overload just within the county of Winona. And that county again is right here in the first. So I want to briefly discuss what regulations we do have of this issue in Minnesota. So in Minnesota, there are two primary permits that apply to feedlots, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System or NIFTES permit which is a federal permit under the Clean Water Act that is administered by the state of Minnesota, and also the state disposal system, which is a state permit. 
Both of these permits regulate the storage, transportation, and use of manure, and both are administered by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And there are these different size thresholds where the different permits apply that are outlined here on the slide. But what I really want to emphasize here is that both of these permits are intended to control the release of animal manure or manure cont contaminated runoff. And the primary way they do that is through construction standards for manure storage areas so they don't leak. Here is a picture of one that did leak. And also requirements to do visual inspections to ensure that there are no leaks. But the other primary tool of these permits is to require facilities to follow a nutrient management plan to direct not just how manure is stored, but also how it is land applied on crop fields. And I really want to emphasize here that land application areas are the root of the problem because this is where both chemical fertilizer and manure is land applied to meet crop needs. So there is a higher probability for nitrate to leach into the groundwater and contaminate water supplies. So in this picture, a truck land applies manure in the fall when the ground is bare, which means up to a 40% higher risk that the excess nitrate will filter to the groundwater because it won't be taken up by the crops. Um, so what this leaves us with is a public health crisis where the public is left to bear the cost of pollution. And this impacts both their wallets and their health. And to end my portion of the presentation, I just wanna stress the fact that this is particularly difficult for private well owners who do not have recourse to a water utility or a state agency when their water supply becomes contaminated. The Karst region that we opened with, with, our discussion with, has many private well owners with old shallow wells, and they are left to cover the cost of treatment, which is up to 7,500 for reverse osmosis, or to dig a new well, which can run from 30 to $50,000. So um, I wanna now hand it off to Lee to discuss the legal tools that we have to address this problem. Yeah, thanks, Carly. Um, yeah, so now that Carly's given you an overview of kind of what the basis of the problem is, where this problem comes from, and then the, the uh, geographic range of this problem, I wanna turn to an action Minis uh, the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy took recently to try to remedy this issue. Um, so first, Carly, you can go to the next slide. Um, I want to start by looking at what the state agency jurisdiction is over groundwater in Minnesota. So as an advocacy organization, this is where we would start looking for solutions. Who has jurisdiction over these various aspects? As you can see from this graph, the jurisdiction over groundwater quality in Minnesota is disjointed. There are at least four different agencies with jurisdiction over different parts. So this led us to look at the Safe Drinking Water Act as a potential tool that um, the federal government can use with jurisdiction over many parts of this problem. You can turn to the next slide. So under the Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, there is a section that allows EPA to address uh, groundwater, drinking water contamination. So as it showed in the last slide, the Minnesota Department of Health um, does have jurisdiction over drinking water quality in Minnesota. That is because it has been delegated that authority under the Safe Drinking Water Act. But under this particular section of the Safe Drinking Water Act, EPA retains emergency powers um, to abate uh, likely contamination of a public water system if it receives information that that contamination presents an imminent and substantial endangerment to human health. So I want to dig into some of the terms used in this section of the Safe Drinking Water Act and why MCEA decided that we would um, try to get EPA to act under this section. And I found that the most helpful source of information about how this section should and could be used was from a guidance document that EPA put out. Next slide, please. So in 2018, EPA put out a guidance memo on how to use this section. And EPA had only put out uh, guidance on how to use this emergency authority in 1976, in 1991, and then in, in 2018. So 
not very often. And the 2018 guidance was issued in particular in response to the Flint, Michigan drinking water crisis that occurred. Um, and EPA put out this guidance for, uh, as it stated in the guidance, quote, one of the purposes of this guidance is to encourage a more widespread use of EPA's section 1431 authority by more fully explaining situations where this authority may be applied. So trying to get uh, a, a broader use of this authority. Um, so next slide, this guidance really looked at some of the key terms in this section of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, so first, EPA can act, can use this emergency authority if it receives, quote, information about the scope of the problem. And the guidance document points out that this is uh, a not a requirement that EPA receive evidence or material evidence of a problem. And that um, distinguishes it from some other federal statutes. So it's a lower bar in order to act. And it reflects the intent that this provision of the Safe Drinking Water Act be used as a preventative tool to protect public health. It is not a tool where we're trying to hold responsible parties accountable. Uh, the other term, the next term, contaminant, it's very clear in the guidance that nitrate pollution is considered a contaminant for a lot of the reasons um, that Carly explained. And then the, this section refers to protecting underground sources of drinking water. And this is really a key term here. So the authority over drinking water in Minnesota is based on um, public water systems. So the Minnesota Department of Health has jurisdiction over public water systems. And that is a defined term that means a well or other system that serves more than 15 people. So it could be a well that serves an entire township. It could be a well that serves a hospital or a school um, or some other transient population, but it has to be more than 15 people. It doesn't include private wells. So homeowners, a house of five, seven people that is living off of a well is not protected by the Minnesota Department of Health's jurisdiction. But under this section of the Safe Drinking Water Act under EPA's emergency authority, the, this uh, jurisdiction is expanded to underground sources of drinking water, which either are those that serve a public water system or could serve a public water system. And EPA was clear in the guidance memo that this means that this emergency jurisdiction extends to underground aquifers um, that many of which serve uh, private wells. So this is really the only tool we found that extends to protecting those private well owners that Carly mentioned um, have been left behind in this crisis. The last term uh, I'll focus on is this imminent and substantial endangerment. So EPA needs to receive information that there's this imminent and substantial endangerment to human health before it can act under this authority. Uh, these terms are explained in the guidance document that for endangerment, it, this includes threatened or potential harm, so no actual injury need ever occur. Again, this reflects the intent of the use of this section to be protective and preventative. Um, it explains that an eminent threat means that there are conditions present that can give rise to this endangerment. It doesn't mean that the harm has to occur in the near future. It can be harm that could take years to materialize like an increased risk of developing cancer. Uh, and then substantial is clear that this can be a, a high likelihood of ingestion, a high likelihood of disease, a threat of serious harm. So there are various ways that the endangerment could be considered substantial. Um, and so under this section, this these terms here reflect one bucket of information that EPA needs to receive. So it needs to receive information that there's a imminent and substantial endangerment caused by a contaminant that has entered an underground source of drinking water. Um, but there's another bucket of information that EPA needs to receive, which is that state and local authorities, you can go to the next slide, 
Carly, um, state and local authorities have not had a uh, effective or timely response to this problem. Um, it's important to note that this doesn't mean that you need to show that there has been no state or local response, um, that they've entirely failed to act. In some cases, this could be a cooperative effort between state and local authorities and the EPA because EPA, for example, has broader jurisdiction um, in certain areas. But once EPA receives these two buckets of information, the threat and the fact that there is no effective or timely response to date, then it can um, initiate action. So next slide, please. Um, so what can the EPA do if it, if it chooses to act under this authority? Um, it can issue either administrative or judicial orders um, to either you know, potentially responsible parties, um, to potential contributors to the problem. It can also issue orders to governments who have you know, maybe need to take additional steps to protect um, public water supplies. And these orders can be uh, sequential as well. So there could be an initial order asking or seeking um, monitoring and an evaluation of potential contributors to really hone in on the responsible parties. And then later orders um, could ask for abatement from those now identified responsible parties. Um, and the, the guidance document lays out an example of when multiple orders might be necessary. Uh, and it says, you know, for instance, in an area with karst geology and more than one source of nitrate contamination, the agency could use multiple orders if necessary. Um, so obviously that's very apt for the situation that we face in Minnesota in the karst region. Uh, next slide. So based on this section of the Safe Drinking Water Act, the fact that you know, this was the only authority we found that really covered all or at least many aspects of this problem. Uh, MCEA decided to send a request, a petition to EPA with the requisite information and ask EPA to use its authority to protect the residents of this region um, from this public health crisis. We were joined by 10 other groups. Um, you can see the list here on this slide of the groups that joined in this request to EPA, um, including local groups, um, statewide organizations like MCEA, and then national groups as well, like Food and Water Watch, um, where Tyler, our next panelist, uh, works. Next slide. Okay, so what do we want EPA to do? What did we ask them to do in this request? Um, so we provided the evidence and the information that we had of the problem and the fact that to date, Minnesota's local and state responses to this problem have not um, fixed it, even though there are attempts um, to address this problem. The, the mere persistence of it shows that they, to date, those uh, attempts have not been effective. So we've asked EPA um, to require that the polluters, the potential contributors to this problem, provide the safe and free alternative source of drinking water um, to those communities and well owners who are uh, faced drink with the choice of drinking contaminated water. Um, we've asked EPA to put a moratorium on any new CAFOs or any expansions on existing CAFOs in this Karst region um, until identified contaminated wells begin to reach safe levels of nitrate concentration. Um, we've asked for public notice of potential contamination events. Um, we've asked for identification in potentially contaminated areas. And this really gets at that public health problem here. We wanna protect the residents of this region um, from ingesting what we know is uh, a major health threat when at these even as Carly said, levels of nitrate contamination that don't necessarily trigger the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act maximum contaminant level, but are still un shown to be unhealthy for human ingestion. Um, and then we've asked for cleanup of contaminated soil. Um, next step, or next slide. Uh, so what's next uh, with this um, action by MCEA and others. 
We will continue to um, work with EPA and see if they are willing to step in to address this crisis. Um, but in the meantime, you know, if we go back to that very first slide, there are at least four agencies in Minnesota with jurisdiction over pieces of the um, pieces of the puzzle that have led to this problem. And so we're going to continue to encourage action by those state agencies and local governments um, that can get at pieces of the problem. Um, so, you know, we see a need to create a more protective feedlot permit for the karst region. Um, we see a need to ex expand the groundwater protection rule, which is a Minnesota Department of Agriculture administered program to a broader scale uh, in order to encompass more of the landscape and more private well owners. Um, there's an ability for local governments to establish um, animal unit caps in their jurisdiction. So in a county level, a township level, they can say, we don't want any CAFOs above this level of animal units um, and really restrict the growth in that way. Um, you know, we want to continue to encourage some of the voluntary practices that so far have been um, the method to try to get at this problem. We want to try to get the, more of those best management practices adopted. Uh, and then, you know, we, we do see a need to establish a source of funding um, for manu manure storage capacity. A lot of the land application that Carly was talking about happens because, especially on smaller feedlots, the storage capacity is, is at risk of being exceeded. Uh, and we it, to avoid an overflow situation, instead, the manure is land applied on fields and not always at times of the year that will maximize the uptake of the nitrogen in that fertilizer in that manure. So there are things um, that can be done at the state level. We will continue to, to work on those avenues while we uh, also work with EPA to step in and take a more holistic and broader look at this problem. Um, so that's uh, my presentation on MCEA's action, and I'm going to turn it over to Tyler to give you more of a national perspective on what uh, is going on around the rest of the country. Great. Thanks so much, Lee. Um, yeah, so as Lee just said, I'm going to take us a step back um, and provide a sort of a perspective on this similar problem. So this issue of nitrate contamination and drinking water from land use predominantly irrigated agriculture and then, and then CAFO operations around the country. You know, this is a problem, sadly, that is not unique to Minnesota and it's not unique to karst regions of the country. This is an issue that rural communities um, really across the country from coast to coast are dealing with. Um, and so it's really an issue of taking a risky ran, a land use practice. In other words, having a large presence of CAFO operations um, over especially vulnerable hydrogeologic conditions, right? So karst regions are a really excellent example of that. So in a large sense, this is a siting problem. You know, we're putting risky behavior on top of really vulnerable um, uh, features of the landscape. And, you know, don't want to, you know, our focus today is nitrate um, because of sort of its unique risk profile to public health. Um, of course, CAFOs have other pollution impacts, be it pathogens or phosphorus. Um, phosphorus in particular just behaves differently in, in the environment. So this Safe Drinking Water Act tool um, isn't quite so applicable to, to, to coping with phosphorus overloads from the, from the same industry. So you can go to the next slide, please. Great, so I'm gonna go into each of these in a little bit more detail. But this is a, just a rough timeline of the Safe Drinking Water Act um, being applied to these types of situations where you have industrial agriculture um, resulting in nitrate contamination of groundwater. And so I'm going to, when I go through each of these individually, I'll lump the 2010 Lower Yakima Valley um, entry with the 2021 Lower Yakima Valley entry. So I'll talk about those together. But in 2014 was the first formal petition that I know of. Um, akin to what MCEA did last year um, for Minnesota in terms of calling on EPA to take action under this uh, emergency authority under Section 1431 um, to address this problem because state officials, state regulators have not been able to do so. So you can go to the next slide for me. Um, 
So beginning there with Kewanee County, um, this is just a map of Wisconsin. In red is highlighted Kewanee County. Um, there's a long history of problematic uh, land use practices in this area and especially nitrate contamination of, of private drinking water. And so um, this petition was filed back in 2014. And actually before I, I wanna take one step back to, our, to the previous slide and you can stay here, Carly. And just note that, you know, EPA has acted under this same emergency authority in other contexts. Flint, Michigan was mentioned. Jackson, Mississippi is another instance where EPA has taken a really big role in a remediation effort. Those situations are a little bit unique from what we're discussing today because they're really focused on a public water system. Whereas here, as Lee really helpfully described, we're talking about an underground source of drinking water. So it's just a little bit more complicated of a problem to address than when you have like a single municipal municipality entity that's providing a public water service that you can then sort of engage with that entity and address the problem that way. Here we have multiple sources, multiple wells, so it's just more complicated. So uh, in Wisconsin, this was filed in 2014. Uh, it was based on both nitrate contamination and pathogenic microbe loading. Um, and so this Petition is a little bit unique in that respect. All of the other petitions I'll discuss are focused squarely on nitrate contamination, um, but those two problems can often come together. Um, and it was, as all of these situations are based on the Wisconsin DNR's failure to do what it could under state law to address the problem, and also its failure to implement the recommendations of what's called the Karst, the Karst Task Force, which laid out a lot of uh, best management practices and other things that needed to be adopted to address the problem, the state failed to, to follow up on those recommendations. And so Kiwani County itself has tried to do what it can, but as is often the case in these um, state and local dynamics, the county has limited authority. And there's a fair number of state preemptive laws that really limit the ability of local decision makers to rein in a problem like this. So it really does fall to either the state or federal regulators. Go to the next slide, please. So, and this is the lower Umatilla Basin in northeastern Oregon. Um, and all these sites are going to provide a map. And thankfully, we're dealing, we're going to talk about four different states that are like roughly the same size. We don't have like a California and a Delaware. So these will give just a sense of like the scale of the different areas that are being focused on in these different petitions. Um, and I'm going to talk about this one in a lot more detail in a couple slides as a, as a case study, as a sort of an example of how this has gone and where we're at today with EPA and state regulators. Um, but this was filed in January of 2020, um, and I will come back to this one. So you can go to the next slide. So the Yakima Valley in Washington um, is actually not far from the lower Umatilla Basin in northeastern Oregon. Um, they have similar hydrogeologic characteristics. Um, and this is an area uh, where, so both of these areas have very large CAFO presences here in the Yakima Valley. It's predominantly a dairy industry. Um, and initially, so this is, it's a really interesting story in the Yakima Valley. In 2010, EPA conducted an investigation in response to, as I understand, some information that was sort of dropped on their desk by an investigative reporter. So there wasn't a formal petition filed that led to the 2010 investigation, but it was a source contribution investigation. So looking at the dairies in the region, um, which dairies are contributing to the problem and why. Um, so that study then led to the state creating the lower uh, Yakima Valley groundwater management area. Um, and it also led EPA to enter into a variety of consent orders with different dairies. And so because of those consent orders, um, dairies, again, after the investigation identified these as contributors, um, those consent orders resulted in individual dairies providing alternative sources of drinking water to residents down gradient of their operations. So where their pollution was flowing to a resident's private drinking water well, that dairy was responsible for either providing bottled water on a continuous basis or providing a filtration system and ongoing maintenance. The lower, the, the groundwater management area um, was largely ineffective. So it's been in place since 2012 and nitrate contaminations have continued to ratchet up over that period of time. And that's unfortunately due to continued expansion of large dairies in the area. So we just have more and more nitrogen on the landscape um, and a failure to recognize that common practices by the dairy industry uh, don't actually do what folks assume they do. In other words, they're not actually that protective of water quality. And so that's sort of just been an ongoing big problem in all of these places. 
So this same investigation, this Yakima Valley situation also led to the Cow Palace case that some of you may have heard of. It was the first time that the Resource um, Conservation and Recovery Act was applied to a CAFO operator for the, the discard of solid waste, i.e. manure, onto the landscape, causing an imminent and substantial endangerment. So like a similar concept to the Safe Drinking Water Act um, um, situation that we're talking about, but more rigorous and just a little bit different. Um, but that was sort of a seminal case. And those efforts continue today, uh, largely relying on voluntary recommendations instead of regulation. And because of that failure to regulate out of the problem and continuing to rely on voluntary only efforts, um, led Food and Water Watch and primarily the Center for Food Safety to file a formal petition in 2021 asking for EPA to step in and take better and more action. And since then, EPA has been engaged with the petitioners and has also been communicating with Washington state agencies on a regular basis, um, sort of expressing the EPA's anticipa anticipated uh, timelines and things like that, just putting expectations out there for the state. Okay, you can go to the next slide, please. So I'm not going to talk about this in much detail because you've already gotten a lot of great detail, but this is uh, the Minnesota Karst region that Carly spoke about. So you can go to the next slide. Okay, so back to the Lower Umatilla Basin groundwater management area in Oregon. And so the map you're looking at here is just a color-coded map of uh, nitrate leaching vulnerability. So this goes back to my point at the top that we're placing, we're citing especially risky land use practices on top of especially vulnerable um, hydrogeologic systems. And so not only is this area uniquely vulnerable, it has a unique history of nitrate contamination, uh, largely and predominantly because of the very large army munitions depot and bombing range that was in the area. So that's been cleaned up, um, but that sort of initially set this nitrate contamination problem uh, in play. But since then, um, the CAFO industry has grown dramatically in the area. And so that was initially in response to Tillamook Creamery um, building a large cheese processing plant in Boardman, which is up along the Columbia River in this area. And that's spurring Three Mile Canyon Dairy, one of the largest dairies in the United States. They have approximately 70,000 head of cattle on site at any one time um, to expand and expand and expand as the primary provider of, of milk for the Tillamook Creamery. Many, several other dairies have also expanded. We also have a very large uh, beef feedlot in the area. And so filed a petition in January of 2020 calling on EPA to do a lot of the same things that Lee outlined for the Minnesota petition, providing alternative sources of drinking water, actually engaging in effective outreach, conducting testing needed to find out whose wells are contaminated, et cetera, but also needing to control the source. We can't provide alternative sources of drinking water or filters forever. So we also have to have, we have to have two tracks. One is addressing the immediate public health concern and the other is addressing source controls. And so since the petition, the issue has gotten more attention, thankfully, um, after decades of sort of languishing without much uh, attention at all. Um, it has spurred some community organizing, which has been really effective to bring impacted communities uh, members together. And it's also led to some citizen-led well testing. So the lower Umatilla Basin area is in both Morrow County and Umatilla County. Last year, Morrow County, uh, uh, declared a state of emergency over nitrate contamination, and that led to more citizen-led well testing, resulting in over 40% of wells tested being well over the 10 uh, milligrams per liter MCL. So most recent developments, um, petitioners have kept pretty constant pressure on EPA since filing the petition, um, and we were able to win two visits, one from regional administrator Six Killer. Um, in March of this year down to Boardman to hear from impacted residents and go on a tour of the area. And then again, we got the deputy um, acting assistant regional administrator, so, some long title along those lines, um, to come down with their lawyers in June and meet with petitioners in the community again to talk about next steps. So you go to the next slide, I'll wrap up here. So the last thing I want to point to is just the importance of the investigatory side of these efforts. So um, I mentioned the Yakima Valley situation. It really was that thorough investigation that led to meaningful traction in the area, successful litigation and ongoing efforts to control the sources of the, the nitrate problem. And monitoring is so critical to having the appropriate responses to a problem like this. And so the image I have in front of you is this is out of Wisconsin. Um, 
these are uh, uh, monitoring results from water and environmental technologies. It's sort of one of the leading engineering firms that does these issues. They're based out of Washington, but they do work all across the country. And the reason why I say monitoring is so critical is because it provides um, granular detail into the actual practices that are causing the problem, as opposed to a lot of the assumptions that live behind the sort of the regulatory structure for this industry. So this cross section shows you the nitrate plumes from the different practices. Um, and so it's maybe a little bit hard to see on your screen, but towards the left of that cross section um, is the actual production area, the dairy where the animals are confined, where the manure lagoons are. And you can see a, a little bit of nitrate leaching from that area, but then right adjacent to that sort of just, just left of center is a land application field. And you can see that huge plume um, running down gradient from there. And so this type of monitoring is what allows regulators or us as citizen enforcers to identify the real problem and to bring compelling uh, enforcement actions or advocate for better practices. That typically doesn't happen. And one of the big problems with that is that the permits these operators function under don't require that monitoring. Monitoring is under the Clean Water Act required of essentially every other industry. Um, and so this is sort of a, an accompanying issue that Food and Water Watch has been working on for several years now, trying to force monitoring into the general permits for CAFOs around the country. Um, so we were able to successfully get a Ninth Circuit ruling out of Idaho saying that the Clean Water Act mandates monitoring, just like what you're seeing here. When a CAFO permit prohibits discharges to surface water through groundwater, uh, our belief is that the Clean Water Act mandates monitoring to actually show that's happening in the real world. Um, you know, there was a mention earlier, and then I'll wrap up and we can go to Q&A that, um, you know, land application practices, the whole structure is really about agronomic production and not so much about water quality. And that's a real problem. And one of the reasons why we see this, this issue, this nitrate contamination popping up in so many places where CAFOs predominate, because there are these assumptions around lagoons and waste storage and land application that just simply don't follow the science and aren't don't, don't bear out in reality. So for example, lagoons constructed to a one times 10 to the minus six seepage rate, which is very standard, is gonna seep millions and millions of contaminated liquid into the ground beneath it every year. Okay, that's not protective, but that there's an assumption pretty much nationwide that a lagoon constructed to those specs um, is you know impossible to have water quality problems, which is not, doesn't map onto reality. So I'll stop there um, and we can switch over to the Q&A. Thanks so much. All right, great. Thank you all. Um, very informative. And thanks for all the good questions. Uh, you can continue to put them in the Q&A button there at the bottom of your screen if you'd like. Um, I thought, Carly, I'd maybe ask you to talk a little bit more about um, well, a couple of questions, I guess. One is, how do we know, for example, that it's manure spreading um, and the application of fertilizer that are the problem, as opposed to what Tyler just mentioned, for example, leaky lagoons or tanks um, or pastured, pastured cattle, for example? Well, first of all, I would say, you know, one of the reasons that we think the EPA involvement is really important is to have a much more thorough investigation into to pinpoint some of the causes, because it may include various um, causes, including multiple uh, things that you just mentioned, Kevin. But the reason that there's a focus on land application is because that is where both commercial fertilizer and manure are land applied, and that is often what pushes operators far above, in some cases, twice as, twice as high as the recommended nutrient application rates. And so that analysis by the Environmental Working Group that I mentioned in 2020 found, for example, that in counties with really high density of animal feedlots, there wasn't a requisite decrease in the number of commercial fertilizer sales. So what that means is, you know, the same amount of fertilizer is often applied, and then the manure, you know, which is a waste product of the feedlots, is applied on top of that. And it's that addition of the manure on top of the fertilizer that is really the root of the problem here. 
And so a follow-up then, to what degree is the land application, specifically a manure, I guess, in this instance, regulated by these feedlot permits? I mean, what role is the state playing there? Are there limits to how much manure can be spread in a given watershed or basin? Um, how does that work? Can you say a little bit more about that? There's some questions around that uh, issue. Yeah, so the land application um, parts of those permits, so those two permits that I outlined are what are relevant here, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit under the Clean Water Act, and here in Minnesota, the state disposal system. And the way those really get at the land um, application areas is through this requirement to have a nutrient management plan. And, you know, these management plans do lay out best management practices, things, language like site-specific conservation practices or appropriate agricultural utilization of nutrients. But there are very few guardrails in place. Uh, for example, there, there, there's no requirement to monitor groundwater. And for the reasons Tyler just outlined, um, that, that could be a really important guardrail to see if that nutrient management plan is in fact effective. But we don't have those guardrails in place. Um, so there's a lot of reliance on these nutrient management plans. And the assumption is that if you follow a nutrient management plan, there will be zero discharge in dry weather. And furthermore, uh, we have this exemption built into the Clean Water Act where um, if you follow a nutrient management plan, you qualify for the agricultural stormwater exemption. And that means um, that's under federal rules. And what that means is that nutrient runoff is exempted from regulation if it occurs from heavy rainfall events. So those are some of the issues that we face, the lack of monitoring to ensure compliance and that these nutrient management plans are effective, and also these exemptions that are built into our federal rules. Okay, thanks. Um, so, I mean, obviously, it sounds like we need a lot more information and monitoring will go a long ways um, to get us that. Um, question for Lee and Tyler about EPA's authority. I mean, ultimately, once we have the monitoring, we can pinpoint the polluter. What, I mean, what authority does EPA have? What would we expect them to do? What can they actually do? Can you talk a little bit about that? And maybe how has that looked in some other cases that are further along? Well, there you go. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I guess EPA's authority is very broad. So they can require testing, monitoring, and they can also get at the abatement part of the problem. And we've asked for uh, we've asked for action on on all those lines. I, as far as places that are further along, I'll, I'll hand it to you, Tyler. Yeah, I mean, I would just emphasize that it is it, um, exceptionally broad federal authority once an emergency situation is identified. Um, so much so that EPA's actions can supersede or can EPA can act notwithstanding existing state regulations, existing permits, um, really like the status quo situation doesn't restrain EPA from, from taking action. Um, so their toolbox is very broad. So again, in Yakima Valley, we saw a really effective investigation. I think that's another thing that sort of all these places need to push for, um, but EPA can also or should be, and this is what they're doing primarily in Oregon and Washington right now, is putting a lot of pressure on state agencies to do right. Um, because as if, it, if this is news to you, then it's news to you, but probably it's not news to most that EPA is really reticent to step on state authorities' uh, toes when they can avoid it. And so in your question of what can we actually expect from EPA, um, I would give a, a, a more um, measured response to what to my to my to my answer of what EPA can do, um, and so I really think that in these situations you're talking about um, a federal state sort of interaction and ensuring uh, as much pressure on those state efforts as possible. Yeah. Um, so what they can do might be different from what they will do or are likely to do. I think so. I mean, you know, with public health issues like this, unfortunately, sometimes it takes it takes a tragedy to get the action that's really needed. So hopefully we don't end up there. And as Lee articulated, the Safe Drinking Water Act was specifically written to avoid actual bad outcomes and to address problems before they reach that, so. Yeah, there's a question here, Lee, about other legal authorities or other avenues to get at this problem, maybe in federal law or even in state law. Um, 
uh, are, are, do you have any thoughts about um, other actions that we or others could take sort of directed at the same thing? Yeah, so, you know, the problem writ large is nitrate contamination, right? Um, and so there are various ways to get at that issue. Um, under federal law, even the Clean Water Act could address you know, some sources of nitrate contamination if it meets various requirements of the Clean Water Act. Um, and then there are avenues under state law to get at various aspects of the problem. This, the Safe Drinking Water Act emergency authority section was really the, the one that we found that got at um, sort of multiple aspects of the problem. The, the fact that this is coming from multiple sources, you know, it's the commercial fertilizer, it's the manure application. It's, and so this uh, EPA can really look at the at the public health uh, problem that is that these residents are facing, rather than just regulatory pieces of of where the problem stems from. If that makes sense, um, but there are other things we can be doing at the state level. So I think we can strengthen, for example, our CAFO general permit in particular in this karst region uh, of Minnesota, this vulnerable region, um, should have tighter regulations on CAFOs. Um, I think the Department of Ag can do more around commercial fertilizer application um, in terms of what the geographic scope of its protection um, in order to, to get at this nitrate problem. And then just more generally, you know, our systems of monoculture and industrial row crop agriculture the drain tile systems um, in our state that exacerbate the nitrate pollution um, in our state. So there's a lot of, it, you know, we're, we at MCA are looking at angles that can get at multiple um, sources of this problem. Um, but this petition uh, we thought was the best way to get at this public health crisis and have a federal authority step in and really help these people um, who are otherwise drinking contaminated water. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Carly, is there anything that you wanted to add there about uh, our water program and just sort of like the focus? If we could change things, what would be our priorities? Yeah, I think Lee put it really well. And I think that what Tyler highlighted, the fact that, you know, some of these other examples of petitions in other places where they've been most successful is where they've been followed up with community organizing we have the Minnesota Well Owners Organization here in Minnesota, which was the petitioner on our petition, and they are doing well testing across the state. We have a lot of local advocacy groups. You really need to continue to put pressure on the issue once the petition has been filed, and that includes action at the state level. And yeah, as Lee said, you know, we, we're interested to look more at our feedlot permits and if a one-size-fits-all state permit system is uh, the right fit for this issue, um, or if we need a more protective permit for certain parts of the state, um, and also contributions to drain tile. And then I also want to just address very briefly this last question in the Q&A, which is the role of smaller operations. And I think this is a really important component also, um, because you know smaller feedlots that aren't required that aren't regulated through a state permit don't have the same manure storage requirements as the really large ones so they can often be more subject to emergency land applications of manure because they run out of space and that's why we're also interested in initiatives like a grant program for smaller operations to increase manure storage capacity great thanks well i want to thank you all for a really informative Panel. I think that we're going to have to leave it at that last word, Carly. And I want to thank all of the participants today for joining us. Um, I do have two things that I want to mention uh, before we jump off. One is that we have more of these free CLEs planned. And so you can get more information about our upcoming CLE on energy law, as well as our in-person half-day CLE celebrating the 50th anniversary of Minnesota's environmental review law on our website, that's at mncenter.org. So I hope that you'll sign up and join us for those. And then second, I have to note that we are nearing the end of our fiscal year. So this is going to be my NPR moment. Um, yes, in just three days, we'll close the books on this fiscal year. And I want you to know that we truly rely on your support. We can only do this kind of work, holding our government and private actors accountable so everyone has safe drinking water with support from folks like you. 
And so please go to our website, consider making a donation today so that we can close out our book strong. Thank you so much for being here. Um, enjoy your day. Thanks all. Thanks everyone.